Welcome to our afternoon session titled Leadership and Leveraging Climate Change Urgency in the 2016 Election. I'm your host today, Austin Rosenbaum, and I'm here to introduce Amory Levins from Rocky Mountain Inter Institute. Good to be back and to help you explore some proven energy solutions that could help take humankind off the self-endangered species list, on which we're the only entry, uh, <laughs> to be uh, replaced perhaps by the oil and electricity industries as we know them a lot faster than they may expect. If America's total primary energy use had grown with the economy at the 1975 level of energy use per dollar of real GDP, we would have used this much energy, uh, but instead we cut that by more than half. Uh, and <clears throat> meanwhile, the total um, renewable energy output doubled, and that's wonderful, but it had a cumulative impact 31 times less than the savings. The ratio of headlines was the opposite because the energy we don't use is invisible. Now, no energy company foresaw this efficiency revolution, and none today fully realizes that the low-hanging fruit keeps growing back faster than we can pick it. And that's growing into, going into fast forward. For example, in lighting over decades, Thomas Edison's incandescent lamps got 10 times uh, more efficient over 130 years. Other types slowly improved, but then came white LEDs, which each decade get 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper. Uh, lighting uses a seventh of the world's electricity, so uh, LEDs decimating the seventh of electricity that goes to lighting are prying open a historic crack in electric utilities business model. Thomas Edison, you see, didn't sell kilowatt hours. He sold lighting services. He charged you a penny to run a lamp for an hour because he knew as an inventor that when lamps got more efficient, uh, he would be better off uh, providing the service and his costs would go down rather than selling the, saved er, selling the electricity uh, and, and losing revenue. But they overruled him in 1892, and utilities have been making the same mistake ever since, selling a, the energy commodity rather than the service the customer wants or an infrastructure. Uh, <coughs> And uh, the oil and gas industries, too, grew up selling molecules so that, uh, you know, rather than hot showers uh, and mobility and cold beer and stuff. So the energy, the, uh, that, that is now catching up with them, too, as customer efficiency cuts their revenues rather than their costs. Now, what else changes this fast? Well, LEDs turn electricity into light photovoltaics, PVs turn light into electricity, uh, and they've been getting cheaper so fast in the upper two blue curves from Germany and the U.S. Uh, that they, that meteorite strike has fatally disrupted electric utilities. The dashed lines are the cost of just the fuel fed into their power plants, and the lower aqua line is wind power, uh, which is now getting so cheap that it often makes old coal, gas, and nuclear plants shut down as uneconomic to run. In fact, photovoltaics are now less capital intensive than Arctic oil, not even counting the ability to use electrons more efficiently than molecules. Now, General Eisenhower wisely advised us to make tough problems soluble not by chopping them into finer bite-sized pieces, but by expanding their boundaries to encompass everything the solution requires. And <clears throat> we find at RMI that, that all four energy using sectors, mobility, buildings, industry, and electricity, save more energy faster together than separately. We also find all four kinds of innovation, not just technology, but also design, not just public policy, but also new business strategy, can combine to create deeply disruptive game changers while old industries are still putting on their boots. Uh, for example, if, if Thomas Edison on the right and his ex-employee Henry Ford on the left took a very long nap on one of their car camping holidays together uh, and then they woke up and saw their businesses today, they'd recognize almost everything except the electronics because at their core, uh, these giant industries, just like John D. Rockefeller's oil industry, have changed remarkably little. 
And yet, today, they face vast disruptions because we got 21st century technology and speed colliding head on with 20th and even 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. So let me put a few words in Henry Ford's mouth. You can imagine him mischievously muttering to Edison uh, <laughs> about when electricity displaces automotive oil, those electric cars will add flexibility and distributed storage to the grid, thereby helping efficiency of renewables to displace giant power plants and the fossil fuels they burn so society can more quickly save electricity and make it differently. And that's going on right now. Uh, the carbon fiber electrified cars I invented 25 years ago, we designed 16 years ago, uh, got adopted and entered the market in 2013. Uh, in fact, I drove here today in this BMW i3 uh, carbon fiber electric car. Uh, <clears throat> whose production is probably already profitable and whose carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries. An improved manufacturing process that we sold into the supply chain can now make a complex two by two meter carbon fiber part in one minute. And making all US autos that way would save one and a half Saudis or half an OPEC at a cost below $18 a barrel because the ultra lighting is approximately free uh, paid for by a two-thirds smaller powertrain and by radically simpler automaking with 80% less investment. Another way to speed this up is fee baits, uh, rebates for efficient new autos paid for by fees on inefficient ones. They're now in six countries. The strongest one in Norway just gave plug-in cars a 33.5% market share. Uh, that is uh, 50 times the U.S level without fee baits. Um, also, by a couple of months ago, 15% of BMW's passenger car sales were plug-ins. I doubt that Bloomberg considered fee baits or ultralights when forecasting that EVs will save 2 million barrels a day of world oil by 2023 to 25, depending on whether they grow at the current 60% a year rate or half that, um, and that they'll probably save 12 million barrels a day by 2040. Now, 12 million barrels a day is six times the imbalance that just cut the oil price 70%. It is nine times ExxonMobil's highest EV forecast. I think they'll have a surprise. Uh, <clears throat> China, however, sold uh, more EVs in 2015 than the world did in 2012. Germany and Holland are seriously considering, with Austria, uh, and Norway making all new cars electric. India wants to make all cars electric by 2030. Uh, things are starting to move. And then there's an even bigger shift in which autos are morphing from pigs, that is, personal internal combustion gasoline steel dominated vehicles, <laughs> <coughs> to seals, that is, shareable electrified autonomous lightweight service vehicles. That's two changes in technology and three changes in business model, all simultaneously, all reinforcing each other's disruptions. Also, two-thirds of the remaining driving can be displaced by smarter urban design. And meanwhile, heavy trucks and airplanes can profitably become three to five times more efficient, all sped by the military efficiency revolution. Together. Uh, just on the heavy vehicles, nearly a trillion dollars is going to shift from oil companies' top lines to customers' pockets. Part of that will go back to providers of electricity and of vehicle grid interfaces. So <clears throat> uh, our team speeds these savings by institutional acupuncture, that is where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We insert little needles in partners like Ford and Walmart and the Pentagon to get that uh, chi, that uh, entrepreneurial juice flowing. And this long transition is already so, so well underway that even uh, six or seven years ago, some mainstream analysts were starting to see peak oil not in supply, but in demand. And sure enough, US gasoline demand peaked in 2007, European two years earlier. Uh, like whale oil in the 1850s, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. And that's before personal mobility shifts from oil to electricity. 
So how does the efficiency that's just happened foreshadow what's coming next? Well, in 1975, uh, U.S. government and industry all insisted the energy needed to make a do dollar of GDP couldn't go down. I heretically suggested in foreign affairs it could go down 67% in 50 years. So far it's down 56% uh, in 40 years. And yet just the innovations that have already happened in that period we now see can save another threefold or twice what I originally thought at a third of the real cost. That's a five-year-old estimate which today looks conservative. And that's partly because what we call integrative design of buildings, vehicles, and factories can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into expanding returns. How fast is that sort of design improving? Well, in office buildings, by more than twofold in the past five years. The 38% saving in our 2010 retrofit of the Empire State Building with a three-year payback was thought to be pretty good until our cost-effective retrofit of the Byron Rogers uh, complex in Denver three years later saved 70%, making that half-century-old federal complex more efficient than the best new U.S. office, NREL and Golden, which in turn is only half as efficient as RMI's new office a half hour down Valley here in, in Basalt, and that's comfortable with no chillers, boilers, or furnaces. And yet its technologies were all available over a decade ago. What has mainly improved is not technology but design, the way we choose and combine the technologies. Uh, so that new office of ours is, is one of the 20 most efficient commercial buildings in the country, and it's the most efficient in the coldest or next coldest climate zone. I hope you'll go visit. My favorite part is the uh, Nega mechanical room uh, <clears throat> where I want to outline on the floor industrial tape like bodies at a crime scene uh, where the boilers and chillers were supposed to go before we designed them out and took back the 25 square meters to use. Now, industry which uses half the world's uh, energy can save a half trillion dollars uh, <coughs> worth net present value just in the U.S. Dow Chemicals already returned over $9 billion on a billion dollar efficiency investment, but there's a lot more to do. Industry, for example, owns most of the motors which use three-fifths of the world's electricity. Half that motor power runs pumps and fans. And yet integrative design made a typical industrial pumping loop use at least 86% less energy uh, for pumping, not by getting better pumps and motors and controls, often worthwhile, but just by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. And this also shrank the pumping equipment and the total capital cost. This isn't a new technology at all. It's just rearranging our metal furniture as designers. Uh, so what does that mean for the electricity that's three-fifths used in motors? Well, from the coal burned in the power plant to the flow out the pipe, there are so many successive losses compounding that only a tenth of the energy in the coal comes out the pipe as flow. But now turn those compounding losses around backwards, right to left, they compound, become compounding savings. Every unit of flow or friction that you save in the pipe saves 10 units of cost, coal, emissions, what Hunter Levins calls global weirding back at the power plant. And as you get back upstream, the components become smaller and cheaper. I estimate that just optimizing pipe and duct friction could save about half the world's coal-fired electricity with paybacks under a year for retrofit and less than zero in new build. <clears throat> and yet that's not in any official study or industry forecast because it's not a new technology, it's a design method. In over $40 billion worth of diverse industrial redesigns for leading global firms, our little shop has, has typically found savings around 40 to 90 odd percent with generally lower capital costs for new build, or in retrofits about 30 to 60 percent with two or three year paybacks. But the energy efficiency revolution and its expansion by integrative design are only part of a much larger energy transformation really our species' biggest shift since agriculture. And it's part of the shift from molecules and atoms 
to bits and packets, from hardware to software, from hierarchies to networks, even as it wipes out sales for the oil and electricity industry, uh, is transforming, for example, electricity from centralized, supply-focused, fossil and uranium-fueled and brittle to distributed, customer-focused, renewable, and resilient. And the deepest change, I think, is how the information age informs, enables, and organizes customers to take power into their own hands. It's smart to sell customers what they want before someone else does. And customers are figuring out that they can buy fewer electrons, uh, use them more productively and timely, produce their own, and even share them with others. For example, a German executive uh, of a uh, utility um, living in Holland is buying his renewable energy directly from other customers on this website. It's a peer-to-peer -peer electricity swapping website called Van de Bron, literally from the source. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> he ended up buying his electricity from the guy at the upper left because he thought that was a really cute piglet and the price was right. Uh, and then he got a long handwritten Christmas card from his electricity supplier. So what utility can hope to compete with that level of customer intimacy? Um, indeed, disruptors <clears throat> are now converging on the electricity industry from at least eight directions. Efficient use is taking their sales while renewables beat their supplies. Uh, Integrative design makes energy savings a lot bigger and cheaper, while customer preferences that drive market choices are shifting. Invisibly optimizing when electricity is used and time-shifting supply through storage intensify the competition from the distributed renewables. Also, new rules can reallocate risks and rewards, and some of the greatest changes come from new financing mechanisms and new business models. So you might think of these as eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse. Um, they, they move fast. They don't just add, they multiply, they even exponentiate. They're not lone wolves, they hunt in packs. Uh, and they multiply quickly, they feed on utility revenues, and together they are creating an alien competitive landscape uh, faster than most utilities, cultures, and stakeholders can cope. A couple of years ago, um, Two, two, two years ago, all central power stations were called dinosaurs. Too big, too inflexible, not even relevant for backup power in the long run. Who said that? Was it Greenpeace? No, it was Union Bank of Switzerland. <laughs> Both developed and developing countries are seeing electricity demand stall or even fall. It's fallen five of the last eight years in this country as our economy grows. In Australia, shown here, just the last five years revolution in demand plus rooftop solar could cut 2020 revenues by about 20%. And the range of prices for US wholesale electricity is now widely undercut by the average uh, US market prices. These are all constant for 20 or 25 years of both wind power and uh, utility scale solar power. Those renewables are temporarily subsidized, although less in general than the permanent subsidies to fossil fueled and nuclear electricity. And confirming that the subsidies don't really matter to the outcome, the renewables are winning in unsubsidized auctions worldwide. I just put in a couple of recent data points uh, for Moroccan wind and for Mexican photovoltaics near the Texas border, unsubsidized. Now, when renewables get cheaper, we buy more. So they get cheaper, so we buy more. And this strong feedback soon leaves traditional forecasts in the dust, as you can see in this sequence of forecasts panting after actuality from the, the, the International Energy Agency. So last year alone, modern renewables, excluding big hydro dams, added 135 gigawatts. That's 22% above Bloomberg's forecast. It's over half the world's new capacity. They also got $266 billion of asset investment, two-thirds of it private. Of all the capacity additions last year, 68% in the US, 74% in Europe were renewable. This is not a fringe activity. It's taking over. 
By the way, in case you read about an MIT report claiming that above about 25% penetration, renewables rapidly lose value, that's a bogus finding caused by very restrictive model assumptions, and we debunked it last year, and we'll do more so in more detail this fall. Now, we're often told that only coal and gas and nuclear stations can keep the lights on because they're 24-7, while wind power and photovoltaics are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. So let me explain why neither part of that statement is true, because one hears this all the time. First of all, variable does not mean unpredictable. Uh, here is how accurately the French grid operator in one stormy winter month uh, forecast a day ahead the actual output of the country's wind farms a day later. And I'll bet they wish they could forecast demand that accurately. Uh, second, the reason we built the grid in the first place is that no generator is 24-7. They all break. And when a giant coal or nuclear plant breaks, a billion watts vanishes in milliseconds, often for weeks or months, often without warning. So we built the grid to handle that intermittence by backing up failed plants with working plants. And in exactly the same way, but often at lower cost, grids can handle the forecastable variations of solar and wind power by backing them up with other renewables, mainly or wholly, of other kinds or in other places. So we can get highly reliable power from a portfolio of largely or wholly renewable sources when they're forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and location. Let me illustrate this with a simulation for Texas, whose isolated grid has almost no hydropower and is not connected to the rest of the United States. Uh, its expected uh, load in a 2050 typical summer week might look like this. It can get a lot smaller and less peaky with efficient use, but it's still 30 odd gigawatts. So now let's do this all with renewables. We can first install enough wind and photovoltaics, and you can see they really are variable, uh, to meet about 86% uh, of the annual need, and then get the other 14% from dispatchable renewables you can have whenever you want, like geothermal, small hydro, solar thermal electric, feedlot biogas burned in existing gas turbines, uh, burning municipal and farm waste, burning obsolete energy studies. Uh, this 100% this <laughs> Uh, this 100% renewable supply can then be matched to the load by putting the surpluses uh, into two kinds of distributed storage that are worth buying anyway, namely ice storage, air conditioning, uh, and smart charging of electric autos, both fully deployed by then, and then recovering that energy when we need it and filling in the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand so now we've got all renewable supply every hour of the year with only 5% of the renewables left over to be spilled. So given the market prices for right now that I showed you earlier, the economics are going to be really good. Now, some national grid operators already integrate variable renewables in this way. <clears throat> the last full data we have are from 2014 when Germany met 27% of its annual electricity needs from renewables, Italy 33, Ireland 20, France and Britain 19. But four other European countries with modest or no hydropower met about half their electricity needs from renewables without adding bulk storage and with superior reliability for Denmark and Germany about 10 times better than ours. The ultra-reliable former East German utility, 50 Hertz, got 49% of its electricity last year just from photovoltaics and wind. So the operators have learned to run these grids, using my colleague Clay Stranger's lovely metaphor, the way a conductor leads a symphony orchestra. No instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously creates beautiful music. Now, in, in other words, we have not just one way, bulk storage, but about nine ways to make the grid more flexible so it can gracefully and reliably accommodate variable photovoltaics and wind power. Here's a purely conceptual and schematic sketch of the supply curve uh, arranging these nine options in order of increasing cost. And your actual costs will vary, but you can see why you would do bulk storage last, not first, so we needn't wait for a storage miracle. 
And those who think we need it and they, they wait for it will be out of business by the time we get it. Uh, now, the world's leading micropower adopter, Denmark, has switched almost entirely in three decades from centralized power plants in red, mainly burning coal, to distributed wind turbines in blue, 86% locally owned, and cogeneration in brown, often burning ag waste. Uh, Denmark is planning to be all renewable for all uses by 2050 at essentially no extra cost, and they're a bit ahead of schedule. The same approach, by the way, uh, enabled Cuba to reduce its serious blackout days from 224 days in 2005 to zero in 2007. And then two years later, when two hurricanes in two years shredded the eastern grid, they still sustained vital services. Many countries are also finding the best renewable sources far away have about the same delivered cost as medium quality renewables nearby. So that plus low speed and taller wind turbines, which make wind power cost effective now in every one of the United States, often let more regional or local renewables displace supposedly necessary ones far away, plus long distance transmission projects. And many utilities are trying to fight solar competition with obstructive rules and punitive fees. I don't, I don't think that's very smart. Let me give an example. The main Hawaiian utility, HECO, first tried to forbid solar-powered houses from hooking up to the grid. They got overruled. So that now that then they proposed to confiscate any leftover solar production, not pay for it. A typical Hawaiian household uses appliances at various times of the 24-hour day, about half of them under the yellow curve while the rooftop solar is operating. So what would you expect the angry customers to do? Well, maybe they'll buy smart appliances which will scrunch 80 or 90 percent of their household loads conveniently into the solar hours, costing HECO nearly all its intended windfall and most of its ordinary revenue. So this anti-solar tariff, like six we've studied, all six, is a, a well-aimed uh, boomerang that will actually <laughs> speed and expand solar adoption. Such smart controls uh, are already worthwhile because in the past 40 years, while photovoltaics got 100 times cheaper, Moore's Law made microchips 10 million times cheaper. And then far easier than leaving the grid, customers can swap electricity with the grid, but use behind the meter storage to time shift power and save money. So in different parts of the United States for households and commercial loads, this just shows in the colored bars the growth of the fraction of electric needs that you can meet cheaper with solar on your roof and batteries behind your meter than continuing to buy from the utility. Uh, you notice most of the utility revenue goes away, about half of it goes away in the 2020s. Uh, and Tesla just moved that three years to the left. Also, those bigger customers are buying several gigawatts a year and rising rapidly worth of renewables. Uh, over half of last year's wind power contracts were bought by big customers, not by utilities. Uh, and 85 percent of those are members of, of our business renewable center uh, or work with Armize's uh, spin-off Black Bear Energy, which helps corporates buy renewables. Now, last year I told you about a, a rigorous, detailed, but readable business book called Reinventing Fire, uh, which you can also now get in Chinese. Um, <clears throat> and it shows how to run the U.S. economy in 2050 using no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, third less gas with tripled efficiency, quintupled renewables, uh, and uh, that means renewables would be three quarters of supply, and we showed how this could save $5 trillion, grow the economy 2.6-fold, uh, strengthen national security, cut carbon emissions 82 to 86 percent, yet needing no new inventions and no act of Congress, but with smart state and other subnational policies led by business for profit. And these best buys are also the most effective solutions to big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. And if you like any of these outcomes, you could support such a transition without having to like every outcome and without having to agree about which outcome is most important. So focusing on outcomes, not motives, is a good way to turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. I'm pleased to report that in the first five years of this 40-year transition, the U.S. is approximately on track. 
uh, just because the private sector smells the $5 trillion on the table. So what might this imply for China, the world's biggest coal burner, oil importer, sufferer from bad air? Well, China's National Development and Reform Commission, which does their strategic planning, got so intrigued by those U.S. findings that, that their best energy modelers undertook a similar analysis with help from uh, their NDRC-sponsored Energy Foundation China, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and RMI. We've now done a two-and-a-half-year project together, 54 people, just finished, about to be published in both Chinese and English. Uh, and uh, it roadmaps the energy revolution that China's paramount leaders have called for. It details how to save $3.7 trillion, run a 6.9-fold bigger economy in 2050, on scarcely more energy than today, shift supply mainly off fossil fuels, emit 38% less carbon, burn 73% less coal, get 12, 12 times more GDP from each ton of fossil carbon. And as intended, this roadmap informed the just approved 13th five-year plan for China. So to solve the energy problem in the world's two biggest economies and two biggest carbon emitters, and they plus similar results in Europe add up to over half the carbon emissions, we just needed to enlarge and integrate the energy problem. And the results may at first seem incredible, but as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries, he said, are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> uh, but a troubling gap is opening between where global energy markets are headed and where man many energy suppliers are still focusing their attention and investment. A lot of them focus hard, as you would expect, on the need for price to exceed cost. But many forget there's another part of the business imperative. Value has to exceed price. If competitors offer a superior value proposition that takes away your customers and revenues, it doesn't matter whether you can profitably provide what your customers aren't buying anymore. Also, when that value proposition shifts, markets can flip with breathtaking speed. Uh, Tony Seba has pointed out some lovely photos from the National Archive that I pulled up. Uh, looking down Fifth Avenue in the Easter Parade. In 1900, you got to look really hard to find the first car. In 1913, you have to look even harder to see if there's a last horse. I'm not even sure there is a horse there. Um, and the horse and buggy industry thought it had decades to adapt, but Henry Ford's Model T got 62% cheaper in 13 years. Car-owning households soared from 8 to 80% in 10 years. Three quarters of them financed by a GM and DuPont innovation called car loans. Well, today, PV modules just got 80% cheaper in five years. Three quarters of California rooftop solar is innovatively financed. Ford's and Edison's industries are emerging. So this horse and buggy thinking is dangerous but still common. As the ex-oilman, late Marie Strong, said, not all the fossils are in the fuel. But du DuPont's former chairman, Edgar Woolard, reminds us uh, that uh, firms hampered by old thinking won't be a problem because they won't be around long term. They're forgetting that the pace of transformation, as these pictures show, is set not by incumbents but by insurgents who are not inhibited by incumbents' business models, legacy assets, or cultures. And investors flee even before customers do. Capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. That's their job. And once they think you're in or even headed for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before they decapitalize you and invest in your successors. So that's how the stock price <coughs> of Solar City did. It just became a utility, by the way, uh, compared to America's fourth largest utility. Here's how a little auto startup in Aut3 called Tesla gained half the market cap at General Motors while selling 0.6% as many cars. Investors still bear scars from the failure of big, strong companies that got too old and slow to survive the IT transition, but investors got rewarded by those that did. A lot of investors now sense that, that the energy industries are getting transformed beyond recognition. They're getting skittish. These changes are happening well within current planning horizons, even current executive tenures, faster than many firms' cultures can tolerate. That's a formidable leadership challenge. As Jack Welch said, if the rate of change on the outside is bigger than the rate of change on the inside, the, rate, the, the end is near. 
But which of these great companies on the left is going to be brave enough to make that perilous crossing as the German utilities Eon and RWE started and join the firms on the right? And which firms are going to uh, stay the course? And which category are you going to choose and encourage? I'll end with two quick thoughts. Today's energy transformation is just, uh, not just fundamental, it's elemental. See, the first industrial revolution was the age of carbon. It created our prosperity and built the mightiest industries in the world from coal and oil and gas. But now that obsolete age of carbon is giving way to the modern age of silicon. Silicon microchips, telecommunications, and software turn people from isolated to networked, turn systems from dumb to smart. Silicon power electronics make electricity interconvertible and precisely controllable and applicable, replacing fiery molecules with obedient electrons. Silicon solar cells enable the ascent of energy from mining the fires of hell to harvesting the breath and radiance of heaven. And this transition is most urgent for the 1.2 billion people who live in darkness off the grid with family income around two bucks a day or less, they have little prospect of getting or affording grid electricity. These impoverished people are paying $38 billion a year, a fifth of the total cost of global lighting, to produce very inefficiently one thousandth of the world's light and thereby harm their own health and release carbon that would rank as the world's eighth country. But now they can banish darkness and teach their daughters and son to read because an entrepreneurial village woman can sell or lease them, for example, an integrated PV, LED, lithium battery, smart chip uh, lighting package like this little pocket-sized Waka Waka, Swahili for shines brightly, which will shine like this for 10 hours on one day's photovoltaic charge or down three notches like this for 150 hours on a day's charge and it will pay back in weeks to months against kerosene. You can microfinance it with scratch cards or with a smartphone that, that you recharge from the USB port. So no longer buying the kerosene is like a perpetual annuity uh, <clears throat> equal to a month's extra income each year. There goes the last bit of Rockefeller's 156-year-old kerosene business. So which of these offerings is more exciting and lucrative and transformational. To which strategy would you entrust your company's fate and our common future? Your choice to speed the disruptive energy system to enable the new, not protect the old, could just save the world. I want to thank you all for your good work and your kind attention. <laughs>